And I want to welcome you all to this conference call on the topics that are associated with the social impact of on for COVID-19. <clears throat> and it has been really amazing for me to see so many of our students and alumni come together to learn about the impact that the pandemic is having on low-income communities in Boston, communities of color and vulnerable communities that are already at so much risk and are now bearing the brunt of this pandemic disproportionately uh, relative to other communities. And so I want to thank you. And I want to also um, thank Lori Gardner, the director of the Human Services Program, and Ted Landsmark, the director of the Chukaka Center, for joining me today for what I hope will be a conversation that further illuminates some of the issues that we're grappling with in the social impactathon so that today as students start thinking about which organizations they'd like to consider for funding this week um, they've got uh, different perspectives other than the one that i've been sharing on how to think about specifically how the pandemic is affecting communities in boston how it's affecting nonprofit organizations and how we should be thinking about our uh, philanthropic investment in, uh, in a couple of organizations because on Friday we will be awarding $20,000 uh, to nonprofits working to address the pandemic in Boston. So Lori and Ted, thank you. And I'm gonna dive right in. And just as a reminder to the students participating, please feel free to put questions in the chat if you'd like to, we will try to get to those. And also keep in mind that your questions are really important because we're recording this uh, to put in the Impact-a-thon for everybody who can't be here right now. So you may have questions that are similar to others that uh, your peers are thinking about. Um, so Lori and Ted, welcome, first of all. I hope you're both doing well. And uh, I know that you think a lot about the kinds of issues that we're addressing in the Impact-a-thon. So let's just jump in first by saying, uh, by asking, what are you seeing from your perspectives as the most urgent challenges that uh, challenges and risks that families in Boston are facing because of COVID? And what do the nature of those risks and challenges tell us about how porous our social safety net is right now? Mm -hmm. Lori, do you yeah. want to kick us off? Yeah, yeah, sure. I can kick us off. Uh, you know, one of the things that I often think about in the 101 class when we are kind of situating the work that we're doing within our social safety net, you know, is really the reluctance of the United States kind of writ large to have robust uh, social policies that support working families and families who may have significant barriers to employment. And so as we were preparing to leave campus, one of the things that we had kind of talked about in our class was, you know, whether or not this would actually be the precipitating event that would allow us to have a paid family leave policy. And when you look at the paid leave policy that they did put in place, medical leave policy, it, ex it sunsets in December. Uh, and that to me is kind of one of the places where I hope we have an opportunity to kind of revisit the significance and importance because one of the kind of myths or challenges with paid family leave advocacy has been that this is really a women's issue and people disproportionately kind of link it to maternity needs and um, you know postpartum care and you know obviously those things are, are very important and can be you know covered and, and addressed well through uh, paid family leave strategies but it is so much bigger than that. Having a system to provide uh, partial wage replacement for individuals who have, uh, who are unable to engage in the labor force due to either their own medical needs or the medical needs of their, um, you know, dependents or partners, you know, is a really important part of having a well-developed social welfare program. Uh, you know, and obviously lots of uh, benefits that people have always taken advantage of, whether it's SNAP benefits, WIC, or TANF, and, and these other programs, you know, we're going to see utilization rates like we haven't seen before, and that extend far beyond what we're really capable of supporting at this time. Yeah. People to access their un um, unemployment benefits in the way that they need. They can't even get an unemployment um, uh, advocate or a uh, caseworker on the phone. They're, they they're not able to get the benefits that they are in fact entitled to. Right. 
So it's showing the gaping holes in our existing system uh, that have always been there, but now the system's even more strained. Yeah. And, and one of the things that's horrific about it is that the demand is exploding for these kinds of services. But one of the things that we might be able to do in response to that is use it to awaken people's awareness of, of how porous the system is, because folks who never imagined themselves to be in need right. of these services are suddenly struggling in ways that it's no longer possible to otherize those people. That's right. These kinds of service. It can be all of us. It can be any of us. And right. um, it's a, a porous social safety net is porous for all of us. Uh, and one of the, uh, yeah, that absolutely right. And one of the things that um, I think is really interesting about the American belief system, when we think about poverty attribution, so why are people poor, we disproportionately attribute poverty to individual flaws, deficits, characteristics, and uh, societies that embrace a more structural poverty attribution have a more established and more developed social safety net and social welfare state. And you, you can see that across um, uh, Western Europe and Canada. And Americans resist, uh, resist those, those realities. And when these things happen, it does exactly what you say. It kind of makes it impossible to deny the structural dimensions of inequality. Uh, and so hopefully we can see a little bit more of an attitudinal change that will support more robust social policies. Yeah, absolutely. Ted, what are, what are your thoughts on, on the vulnerabilities and what it says about our safety net? Well, I think of two things, actually. Um, one is the whole set of uh, vulnerabilities that Lori uh, has begun to address around uh, families and large-scale public policies and uh, the extent to which there have been uh, long-term inequalities in access uh, to certain kinds of resources, particularly very basic ones like cash flow and income and access to education and access to the pipelines that uh, enable people to find their jobs initially, find their way into the best schools initially, find their way uh, into the marketplace. Um, and uh, certainly it's my sense at this moment that those inequalities uh, across multiple sectors um, are going to be exacerbated. And as bad as things are at this moment, um, I think they're going to get worse over the course of uh, this year um, and into the beginning of uh, 2021, um, as we may or may not see uh, a change in uh, national policies coming out of Washington. And then the related piece from my perspective is what happens to the organizations themselves um, that are uh, delivering uh, a range of social services and cultural services and uh, other kinds of human and educational services. And one of the things I'm seeing at this moment um, is that there's already a large and growing gap uh, between those organizations that have the capacity and the capability uh, to tap into uh, those resources that will permit them to be resilient eight months from now or a year from now, and those that don't. Uh, so an organization, well, I won't name organizations, but a very large cultural organization, uh, very close to uh, uh, Northeastern, um, laid off several hundred workers. But even as they were in the course of doing that, they had already retained the services of a strategic planner um, who could begin to work with them about what it was going to be like a year from now not to have the same numbers of visitors and therefore the revenue stream that they had three months ago. Um, and I see that in some of the other larger organizations as well. And yet when I've spoken to my colleagues in uh, some of the very small human services and uh, social service organizations, um, many of them are, are still surprisingly sanguine about their prospects. That is, they're saying, well, you know, we have our state funding or we have our federal funding grant and that'll take us through the end of the fiscal year and then we'll see what happens. But the reality is that uh, federal revenues are going to be way down. Uh, state revenues are going to be way down. 
um, and all of the large public funding sources are going to be looking at ways to cut their budgets. Um, and it, it's not going to be long before uh, many of the uh, smaller organizations are being asked to cut their budgets by 20 or 30 or 50 percent. Um, and they're going to have to make some very wrenching and difficult uh, internal decisions about whether they cut programs or whether they cut staff or whether they cut outreach. Um, and most of them, and even though they've lived kind of hand to mouth for many years, are not really doing the kind of strategic planning that will determine whether they as organizations will be able to survive beyond the end of this fiscal year. Um, and so I have a real concern that uh, even apart from the policies that they're trying to implement on the ground, there's a real question as to whether and which uh, of the groups will be able to survive to continue to do anything uh, come this fall or into uh, the beginning of 2021. Yeah. And you know what strikes me about both of your comments? There is such a through line. Um, we always talk about the systems orientation that we take in the social impact lab. But what we're looking at is this domino effect of families, individuals who are already extremely vulnerable uh, in a system where for many of us, our income and our health insurance are tied to our jobs. So if we don't have high paying jobs or access to any jobs for all of these systemic barriers that, that Ted, you referred to, um, we're already dependent in large, in many ways on a social safety net uh, that was already porous. And now as those jobs are becoming increasingly threatened, as you're saying, the demands on the safety net are increasing beyond belief. And some of the more resilient organizations that can afford strategic planning or that can, can shift funding are trying to do that, but the ones that have already been vulnerable themselves uh, don't have the wherewithal to do that. And I think it is incredibly risky to think about what's gonna happen uh, in the, the 10, 12 months ahead, because as you're saying, Ted, it's not just um, that they're gonna be losing their donor bases, um, but we're also gonna see foundation endowments starting to collapse because of the stock market. We're going to start seeing um, public funding shrink because we're going to have to be triaging in such extreme ways um, that there is not going to be money uh, that these organizations have tended to rely on. So I do think that we're looking at this potential um, downward spiral in which the demands for these uh, human services organizations are going to be exploding at the same time as the funding is collapsing. And, and you know, people say, well, and we got through 2009, um, but we're looking at something of magnitudes greater in terms of the challenges to the human, to the human services sector. Um, I also want to ask you, you know, one of the things that there's this parallel, I think we're seeing where um, folks who have some of these lower paying jobs that we now are considering essential, mm -hmm. right? We're never paid enough to do mm -hmm. the work of um, keeping our, our stores stocked, um, collecting trash, uh, caring for our children. You know, all of these jobs that we're suddenly realizing really are fundamental to a thro thriving and healthy community. Um, we're recognizing, oh man, they are not paid enough. Now they're essential workers. Um, they're, they're often representative of these communities that were already vulnerable. So now they're being exposed to the virus more right. and bearing more of the burden of health. We see incredibly disproportionate rates of infection in communities of color and low income communities because they're out there working on the front lines uh, and don't have the same access to health care. And it strikes me that in many ways, our nonprofits, our human services nonprofits, are also those essential workers, right? The essential worker be organizations that keep us healthy and safe and well, that are always underfunded and now are on the front lines facing more risks and, and are also really, really challenged right now. Um, and I just wanna just like put that out there and get your reaction mm -hmm. to it because this is not by chance. It's not just because the pandemic is happening. It's because right. of these systemic vulnerabilities that we have built in. Lori, as you said, from the way we conceptualize the nonprofit sector itself. Right. And I, and I think that's absolutely true. And we are seeing disproportionate representation of certain groups who are who are the ones who are getting kind of re repeat exposure and how people are working within organizations, I think is really interesting. And 
you know, I think in some ways it's similar to what's happening in the education sector. Some of these organizations are using this as a forced opportunity to innovate and to think creatively about how they're going to access people who need their services. And, and maybe the small, tiny little silver lining of that unfortunate requirement to pivot will result in some, you know, improvements in some level of service delivery for people who were not maybe able to access services in the past. Uh, some organizations, by the nature of the work that they do, are better situated uh, to make those modifications and adjustments, and then obviously others simply can't divide, deliver the types of services that, you know, that they're designed to because they can't have human contact, you know. Um, I think I think all of that is is exactly right, and I and I do um, I do wonder how, how what the long standing implications in service delivery are, are essentially going to be as a result of these modifications and, and shifts, uh, and and I do think again as you say we do, we have over representation of certain groups in these roles. There was a I, there was a New York Times article a couple of days ago, and I think it was seventy eight percent of social workers are women. I mean, we know that, uh, but they show just they kind of graphed, you know, the disproportionate representation of women, especially in, in the healthcare sector and in social services. Yeah. Yep. Women and women of color in particular are, yes. carrying, mm -hmm. this, are carrying this burden, uh, as always with all of the burdens um, in disproportionate numbers. Ted, your thoughts on these issues? Well, yeah, and to a large extent, uh, these service providers are invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, totally invisible. The, the people who uh, live in East Boston, for example, and, and go to the airport uh, first thing in the morning to uh, clean out, uh, the, the people who work uh, at health centers or who are working at our hospitals on, uh, you know, night shifts and the like, those, those folks are totally invisible uh, to many of the rest of us. And it's not until we encounter a crisis of this type that we see not only how invisible they are, but how the infrastructure that we've developed that serves those of us who are pretty bourgeois, frankly. Uh, we have access to the internet. We have access to hotspots. Um, we shop at Whole Foods. We um, uh, have access to all kinds of things that we take for granted that kind of access isn't available to other folks and it's forcing us all to uh, rethink how we find again those people who to a large extent have really become invisible around us. So it, it means for example that the city of Boston has sent sound trucks out um, into various neighborhoods uh, addressing in different languages not only COVID but the need to sign up for the census. Now sound trucks are technology that goes back really to the 1940s and 1950s. Um, it, it's not the way we normally communicate with people and yet um, it's one of the few ways that uh, seems to be working at this moment. Mm -hmm. Thousands of uh, computers were distributed to kids in the Boston public schools to their homes only to, for, for all of us to realize uh, with great dismay that many of the kids were living in uh, buildings or in neighborhoods where there wasn't internet access and therefore they lost touch uh, with any kind of access to uh, continued learning. And, you know, certainly in Boston, we learned during uh, busing and the like that if people lose touch with learning for even six months to a year, it has lifelong effects uh, that are very difficult to catch up from. So we're dealing with an already vulnerable uh, population, largely made up of women and people of color across the city, across the region, across the country. Um, and part of what's happening is that uh, we're realizing that we have to look at different ways of um, overcoming the invisibility of those essential workers so that we can really reach out and serve them. Yeah. You know, Ted, I've been thinking about the notion of invisibility and essential. And, you know, we talk about these essential workers. Oh, we're suddenly all appreciating these workers. Um, the question to me is, are we actually appreciating them as human beings, in which case we would protect them better and we would pay them better? 
right? If we think of them as essential members of our community, we would be responding differently. Well, I think the message actually is, well, the work you do is essential. We want you to keep doing that work because the rest of us need it. Um, it's essential for us to function. Um, but yeah, you're gonna be at greater risk because of that. And if that doesn't cause some kind of reckoning, um, I, I will give up hope for us because truly uh, it has never been clearer that we have got to value people as human beings and care for them, not just say, yes, you get to go out and still keep doing that work so that the rest of us can stay in and, and stay safe. Um, also, I, this notion of invisibility, I want to ask you both, you know, in the Social Impact-a-thon, we decided to focus on these very kind of universal and urgent needs that many families um, that were already at risk are facing of financial insecurity, food insecurity, um, and housing insecurity, right? Because those are the things you start to feel first when perhaps you lose your job or you're becoming sick. And, and those are the immediate impacts. And, and we have to have some filters, so we chose those. But we know that invisible to many of us are other incredible ch and challenges uh, that are going unseen perhaps or untreated because we're focusing our attention on, on COVID patients. Um, so I wonder, Lori, what are your concerns? What are you mm -hmm. worried about that is happening inside people's homes, behind the walls that we're not seeing, or that maybe are percolating now and are gonna explode as crises uh, two, three, six months, a year down the road uh, yeah. that we're not maybe even thinking about yet um, as, we, as we triage our priorities? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I know in the last probably two, three weeks, intimate partner violence, of course, has gotten a lot of attention. You know, when we really decided to address intimate partner violence in the 70s and then the 80s in the United States, and we came up with this whole notion of a, commu a coordinated community response, right? We recognized that we needed um, hospitals, we needed law enforcement, we needed religious communities, we needed all of these institutions to be working in concert to prevent and respond to intimate partner violence. And our laws needed to catch up and our attitudes and beliefs needed to catch up. And, you know, as a result of those efforts, we've seen a precipitous drop overall up until now in rates of intimate partner violence that happen in the home. And so a lot of really promising things concurrent to everything that we did in the legislature and through this kind of coordinated institutional response, women's ability to engage in the workforce also increased during that period of time. So there was this larger kind of macro background that uh, allowed for real um, improvements in terms of rates of of violence in the home, gender-based violence in the home. And now there's a big concern again, we're seeing um, usage of hotlines increasing, uh, you know, some of the 911 calls have kind of been mixed in different communities because a lot of people aren't utilizing uh, emergency services, interestingly, in the same ways. Uh, so we're, we're seeing this kind of globally. So Spain, the UK, and the US, everyone is reporting this as, as a concern and an issue. Uh, uh, and that, of course, is, is something of, of great concern and, you know, violence, um, again, against children as, as well as, as families are experiencing just, un, I don't want to say unprecedented levels of stress, but a, a, a kind of stress that is definitely unique and exacerbated by already pre-existing difficult uh, circumstances. And then other things that I think there's going to be some things that will reveal themselves after, <laughs> after everything kind of shakes out. And, you know, some of the things that I'm very conscious of, and a lot of people are talking about is substance use and abuse. Mm -hmm. um, but overall mental health concerns, people who are living with, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, what is, what is this experience been like for them? Um, and anyone who's living with a profound psychosis and paranoia. Uh, so there are a lot of mental health concerns and a lot of people who may or may not be accessing services right now because they don't want to put themselves at an increased risk. So I think there are a lot of these things will reveal themselves, but we already know that there are some things that are becoming more compounded. Yeah. Uh, as as the situation is unfolding. Yeah, you know, and we're also hearing, um, I think, kind of some of the data that we already see that's not exactly on point to what you're talking about, but related is the way emergency rooms are show, seeing people who aren't showing up with stroke yep. symptoms or heart attack symptoms. Right. 
because they're afraid of getting COVID. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. And so we see physical health uh, problems not being treated. And I think exactly the same in, in probably even greater and more widespread ways, existing yep. and emerging mental health issues. You know, everybody right. has come out right. of this with some degree of trauma. Um, right. Our health professionals are all being traumatized right now. Our first responders are all being traumatized. Yep. And individuals are experiencing all sorts of new kinds of traumas in, in their personal lives. So I, I think you're absolutely right that there is going to be um, just layers of, yep. of things that we're going to have to be looking for and prepared for uh, at the same time as we're dealing with this um, increased demand and, and reduced resources. Ted, what are, you, what are you thinking about that we're not seeing yet, but it's happening or we're going to be uh, experiencing it down the road? Well, uh, you've already hinted at uh, some of the issues around uh, health, for example, uh, heart disease, stroke, those kinds of things. And um, it, I know that in uh, communities of color in particular, uh, there's almost certain to be a spike in issues related to diabetes, uh, to poor diet, uh, to people who uh, may not uh, in fact, in, in most urban areas, will not have a drive-through window uh, in order to pick up their uh, prescriptions if they go to CVS or, or Walgreens, and so uh, they may not be able to access their uh, uh, prescriptions, um, and I think that that's going to show up in a longer-term sense. Um, I'm concerned that uh, any kind of forbearance around housing uh, related to evictions and the like uh, at least at this moment, uh, will only last uh, a number of months. Um, and uh, come September, uh, we could see a wave of uh, tenant evictions uh, from people who uh, are not in a position to pay their rents and still haven't become uh, reemployed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that strikes me as a long term consideration. Um, and then there are just elements of uh, exercise. There's a lot of exercise that many people get um, that doesn't usually count as exercise as such, but um, as the length of time that people are at home uh, lengthens, uh, we're going to start to see more and more people who begin to suffer from uh, muscle loss and a range of other things that uh, accumulate because you're not just getting out and walking to and from uh, the local store. Uh, and I suspect that will lead to falls, that will lead to uh, more physical trauma for the elderly. Um, and finally, I'd say that uh, we're not through all of the problems that we're going to see at uh, nursing homes and care facilities. Yeah. Uh, Which are I, not getting nearly the attention and the support that they need despite being no. at such a risk. You know, both in terms of uh, the residents and the staff um, uh, at those places, and in a uh, related way, um, I don't think uh, there's much attention that has yet been paid um, to all the home caregivers who are going mm -hmm. in and out of um, homes wherein they're caring for people who are homebound. Yeah. And my guess is that by the time we get to fall, a lot of that will have accumulated in ways that uh, start to show up in uh, significant drops in the availability of uh, uh, the numbers of caregivers mm. who are available to go into homes or to work in our nursing homes. Uh, and I think that's going to be highly problematic, particularly for seniors. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and all of that, because I, I, you're, you're both just spot on with this, this kind of um, overwhelming list of things we need to be thinking about. We're also looking at, I think, a fairly inevitable point at which we have to start returning to some kind of more normal activity um, before there are vaccines for all of us, before we have uh, as many treatments as we would like. And so we're going to be dealing with this period of social isolation. I think we're gonna also move into a period of social anxiety when we are having to be out and about in the world more, knowing that we are all carrying some level of risk that uh, those of us who have been privileged enough to be in isolation have, have been separate from right now. Um, and so figuring out together what that transition back to some new normal looks like is also gonna be a really stressful time, I think. Yeah. I I, yeah, I agree. Precedence. Yeah. 
So, well, and I think too, as I was listening to Ted, what I was reflecting on is how, uh, you know, just to be frank, short-sighted, the federal interventions have been to date, you know, and, and really not entirely developed. And as we, you know, they've, they've, you know, we've got a small stimulus and, that, and that's been helpful, I know, for families, but it's not nearly going to be, and none of this is enough. Uh, and, you know, we want, I want to be seeing more uh, conversations and long-term planning uh, of the nature that Ted talked about with the cultural organization who's planning a year out. You know, I, I, it would be great to see our leadership have those conversations. Yeah. I know that cultural institutions here in Boston and in New York um, are actually planning two to three years out because they anticipate um, that people won't go to those uh, venues uh, again for uh, another two and a half to three years. Yep. And of course, it was deeply troubling when we talked about the distribution of federal funds and policy uh, to see that the Los Angeles Lakers took a four and a half million dollar uh, uh, a government uh, bailout loan, they finally decided to return it. Um, and there are other large institutions that have done that as well. But as we know, um, smaller organizations, and particularly smaller community-based organizations and churches and the like that are eligible to receive those funds, haven't had the kinds of banking relationships, right. long-term banking relationships, so that their bankers could prioritize them as these funds became available. And there was a piece on NPR just this morning uh, that talked about the church in Detroit where the church contacted the bank and was told for an extended period, oh, we're not giving out any money, we're not giving any, out any money, we'll let you know when we do. And when the email finally came, it said, oh yeah, the money is gone. Yeah. Um, so unless the smaller organizations, the uh, service organizations already have very strong relationships with banking institutions, there's a very good chance that they won't get any of this money while large corporations are getting it. Yeah. Yeah. Ted, can I ask you from your insights into urban planning, the way Boston works, first of all, could you just comment so everybody's aware of what the current eviction forbearance uh, position is of the city? And then I'd also like to ask you, uh, and I, I'm not asking you just to critique Boston, but from an urban perspective, given what the demands on cities like Boston and New York are right now, is there any bandwidth to even be looking a year or two out at the recovery process the way the cultural institutions are? Or is that something that's just beyond what a city that's getting hit really hard right now has the, the ability to think about? Well, um, the mayor of Boston and uh, his administration have declared a several month moratorium on eviction so that uh, between now and presumably about September, uh, there um, presumably won't be people who will be put out on the street. But I know from uh, my role sitting on the planning board that there's gonna be tremendous pressure uh, coming from the real estate community uh, to set those uh, kinds of uh, 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 moratoria aside because a lot of landlords are going to be anticipating that there will be students coming back to Boston, that they will want to fill uh, vacant apartments, that they will be in a position to pay more than some of the existing tenants can. Um, and uh, there's going to be all kinds of pressure to lift any moratorium um, of that type, both uh, in Boston and in adjacent communities that uh, have put some protections in place. Um, and so uh, we as academics actually play a, a kind of a secondary role in driving uh, what happens in the real estate market um, in, in a way that uh, we don't always think about, but in a way that could have devastating effects on people who may not yet be back at work and may then find themselves being told that they have to leave their houses. Yeah. And how about that bandwidth issue for longer term planning? How realistic is it for them to even be thinking that way? I think that there are uh, a number of people, at least in Boston City Hall, and I think in Cambridge and some of the adjacent towns too, um, that are thinking about that. But uh, the challenge that everyone is going to face is the challenge of providing for more 
uh, affordable housing, which is a challenge that we have not met at all well, even during uh, a period of great prosperity and during a period of great building. Um, we, we just don't see or have either the funds or the incentives uh, to build affordable housing. And I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, whether a unit is an affordable unit or a luxury unit, the base cost of building a new unit of housing in Boston starts at around $400,000. And the only difference between an affordable unit and a luxury unit is in uh, the amenities and the location. And we have not seen anyone funding um, uh, the uh, infrastructure uh, to uh, build affordable housing in certainly more than a decade. Um, so while people can talk about longer term planning, everything is going to be driven by the availability of resources, which are not likely to be available in the short run. Right. Yeah, none of those questions are going to get any easier as a result of this. Um, I just want to let students know we, we don't want this to go on too long because we know you have a lot of work to do in the Impactathon identifying organizations today. But if you have questions, you can start putting those in the chat. And I want to ask Lori and Ted, both of you, um, for some advice for, to our students right now as they're grappling with this uh, real challenge, this ethical and practical dilemma of having a limited amount of resources and the ability to invest them right now and some of these organizations that are facing such huge demand, what would you encourage them to look for in terms of the attributes or practices of nonprofits that you think might incline them to be well positioned to respond to their community's needs right now and to use this money as effectively as possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, talking to folks who are in the field right now, I, ha I have seen some innovations and I have seen organizations who are very responsive and, you know, it's hard to say kind of the degree to which that's consistent across all organizations. So I would really be looking for, you know, entities that are finding ways to connect with their community, both through some of the, you know, strategies, you know, Ted was talking about, you know, that the city is going around and, and uh, using, you know, old technologies to connect with people. Uh, and that's fine, too. Uh, and then also, you know, innovations in with using some more kind of contemporary ways of engaging with folks. So to me, it's less important that they're kind of innovative in the way that we think of innovative uh, through a technology lens or perspective, but that they're meeting people where they are mm -hmm. and they're finding ways to organizationally reflect the community that they are serving. Um, I might also be mindful, it's not the most important thing, but you know, looking again at the financials and seeing that there is a diverse um, pool of um, funding sources that they're drawing from so that will give you a little bit of insight into their stability overall uh but there's you know th this is going to be a challenge and it is going to be a um you know a, an opportunity to think long and hard about what makes an organization you know effective and and uh, it's going to be even more so than than the usual exercise of going through uh, an experiential philanthropy initiative. And, and these are grueling decisions. You know, just last week, the students who participate in Northeastern Students for Giving had to make their decision about their $10,000 grant. And they gave it to South End Community Health Center, but they were very careful to reach out to the organizations and say, and ask specifically, what is it that you're doing to adapt? And, and they found out that uh, South End Community Health Center is moving to telehealth. And I think that's mm -hmm. an example of it is a technology innovation, but they're still grappling with all of these issues of, you know, as, as Ted referenced, you know, do people have access to right. telehealth? Do they have the bandwidth? Do they have internet right. service in their communities? And and grappling with with that. But um, I think you're right. We do see evidence of them trying to to meet folks where they are and adapt where they can. Ted, what would you have us looking for this week as we make these hard decisions? Well, I certainly uh, echo your comments and Lori's comments about bandwidth and capacity. Uh, one of the things uh, we uh, too often see is that you have an innovative uh, executive director uh, and a recalcitrant board of an organization um, so that uh, where, the, uh, where, where one party 
may be very open to embracing change, whether the change is forward towards technology or backwards towards other types of outreach, um, there isn't a, a consistent commitment within the organization to recognizing uh, the change is essential. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course it is, things will never be quite the same again. And that may drive some organizations to have to think about mergers or acquisitions or other types of consolidations that would have been unthinkable a month ago. Um, but the question is, does the organization have the internal capacity and the bandwidth uh, to, to look out two or three years, not just ahead to the next six to eight months, uh, to embrace the kinds of uh, changes that will enable it to continue to meet its mission? Yeah. And you know what's so hard about that is um, people love their organizations and think in terms of their, their obligations to pay their staff, to serve their communities, to keep these programs that they have been building in some cases over the course of decades uh, to keep them running. And at some point, I think you're right with the mergers and acquisitions, we may be looking at the need to say, maybe preserving the mission means forfeiting the organization and that we're going to have to consolidate we're going to have to come together and manage these enormous just monumental shifts in the environment to serve as many people as we can collectively even if that means sacrificing some of the organizations that have been doing it and that's a really painful reality to be looking at but um, i expect that many of the people who've committed their lives to working in these human services fields are going to understand that sometimes meeting people where they are um, is about making these hard decisions based on community needs as opposed to the organizations themselves. Mm -hmm. So, well, um, so much more we could be talking about, um, but I wanna respect your time. And I know that these students all have a lot of other stuff they need to do today as part of the Impactathon. So I think we'll wind things up there. I wanna thank you both for your insights and your time. Um, this was, a fascinating conversation, as difficult as it is to, to have them. I think it's essential that we be doing it. And I want to thank all the students who joined us. And for those who will be watching the recording later on, thank you as well for taking the time to learn about all of this and taking the responsibility of making these funding decisions as seriously as you are. Uh, it's why we're all here together to learn and to give. And uh, I just appreciate the spirit and values that you're all bringing to that endeavor. So thank you all very, very much. And if you would like to uh, put your cameras back on and unmute yourself, it's always great to see everybody together. So please come back together as a community. Let us look each other in the eyes, though virtually, so we can see who's here. Love to see you all. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. And I will see you back in our Slack channels later today. Yay. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.